Hello, my name is Molly Delmont. I'm a senior in the biology department here at Virginia Wesleyan University, and I'm excited to share with you the research I conducted this semester on termites. Um, the termites that I studied were actually not reticular termites flibbit bees, uh, as is shown on this slide. They were actually a closely related species known as reticular termites virginicus, but I will give you some more information on that in a minute. Uh, first, termites. It sounds like a strange project to be working on. I uh, had no experience prior to this in entomology at all, but uh, I learned to maybe not love them as Dr. P does, but appreciate them nonetheless, especially for the important role they play in nutrient cycling, specifically in breaking down cellulose uh, of decaying wood in our uh, natural forests. So the species I worked with is Reticula termes virginicus. When I was initially searching for termites to harvest, the only termites that were found because it was early in the year, late January, early February, were workers. Um, it's very difficult to identify species of termites just on their workers. Um, as is shown here, they have a complex caste system, including alates, which are their kings and queens, the primary reproductives of the colony. Uh, workers, which are the bulk of the colony, they work to uh, break down the wood, burrow out galleries, uh, feed the soldiers, and uh, care for the young. And then there are uh, soldiers to protect the colony and supplementary reproducti reproductives that uh, assist the king and queen with uh, laying eggs. Um, it is necessary to carefully observe the alates or the supplementary reproductives to determine the species of the colony. Um, because none of these casts were available when uh, we were doing our initial collection, we uh, assumed that they were reticular termes uh, flibipes, but it was later found that they were identified as uh, reticular termes virginicus. However, virginicus and flibipes are closely related. Both are subterranean termites. Uh, they're native to North America, specifically the American Southeast, which is where we are located here in Tidewater. Um, they are eusocial, which means that their society is organized so that one female or a select group of females uh, produce all of the offspring for the colony. And then those offspring are cared for collectively by a smaller, I'm sorry, a larger sterile group of individuals. Uh, there, you can see uh, termites in the gallery. You can also see them there and there on the side. They're burrowing into this decaying wood, uh, not only to feed, but to house the colony. For this study, um, understanding the social behaviors of subterranean termites is essential to studying the mechanisms by which uh, the colony develops pathogenic immunity to uh, fungus, bacteria, and other invaders in the colony both in higher and lower termites. There is a wide range of mechanical, chemical, and behavioral tools evolved by termites to defend the colonies against pathogens. Nest architecture is often specific to a certain species and uh, operating as a, a useful tool for identifying the species. But because these termites are subterranean, it's a little more difficult to uh, check out what's going on underneath the ground where they're nesting. Um, it has been indicated that nest architecture may be a key factor in the development and the maintenance of the colony's social immunity. So there was a study done by our very own Dr. P back in 2010, um, where she set up a group of nests similar to what was done with this study, actually almost identically. Um, but there were some issues uh, with the nests being checked every day, possibly that had an impact on the results. So for this study, I wanted to look at how the nest architecture affected the termite survival and what interactions I could observe in the nest because they were artificially constructed and they were made with clear petri dishes so we could observe what's going on uh, as far as social interactions where we otherwise couldn't because they're underground. So similar to Dr. P's study back in 2010, um, I'm going to follow relatively uh, similar procedures, but um, I'm gonna check the nests every four days instead of every 20. Um, obviously, it is a different termite species that was not our intention at the set onset of this project, but they are similarly related. So, you know, we're just going to power through with it. Um, the fungal source, mine is uh, derived from a fungus that was found out in the uh, environment, in an environment very similar to the one we have here in Tidewater up in Maryland. Um, so the source from the original study was 
ordered from a manufacturing company. So that is one, one change. Um, in the initial study, there were two gallery nest types, um, but the data showed that there wasn't too much of a difference, not a significant difference between the two gallery nest types, one with more holes in the cardboard, one with less. So I just went with the less uh, hold cardboard for my gallery nest. And finally, um, we had some trouble getting the concentration of the fungal solution up to the uh, power of eight, 10 to the power of eight that we uh, was in the previous study. But so in this one, we just had to go because of time constraints with a less concentrated fungus. So this project began in late January, early February. So the subterranean termites in this area were still underground uh, for the winter. Um, the advantage to the small window of time before the colony uh, collection served as an opportunity for us to mark potential colony sites where there would be evidence of termite activity or where there would appear to be in the right stage of decay for termite nesting. I actually spent Valentine's Day sawing logs and collecting termites and bringing them back to the environment, environmental chamber in Greer. The colonies were stored in opaque plastic tubs in the environmental chamber to maintain relatively consistent light, temperature, and humidity. Uh, once the collection was complete, the construction of the nests began. Four nest architectures were constructing, constructed according to the methods described in uh, Dr. P's uh, 2010 study. There was a single chambered, a multi-chambered, an amorphous, and a gallery nest. Uh, the nest materials included large and small Petri dishes, Pioneer brand plastic containers and a flute corrugated cardboard. After several meters of cardboard and over 3000 holes punched, the components were autoclaved before the nests were constructed. Uh, autoclaving the cardboard just meant that the uh, termites were being introduced into a sterile environment. So we know that if uh, there was anything that they were potentially going to be exposed to, we eliminated that through sterilizing the components. Uh, there were a few preliminary studies that were done in phase one, uh, including the culturing of the metarhizium fungus, the preparation of the fungal solution, and then measuring the solution's concentration, and playing around with the infrared camera and the Nile blue dye. So stock solutions of metarhizium were prepared via the methods described in Ro Rosengas and Trinello and Rosengas et al. Uh, the original fungus samples were cultured from a soil sampler. Soil samples similar to the environment, uh, again, where we obtained the termites. The controls uh, that the termites were introduced to in phase three were composed of two soldiers and 18 workers, and the fungal nests were composed of one soldier and 19 workers, just because of the availability of the soldiers in the colony. The termites in the fungal treatment were exposed to one mil of uh, fungus solution for one hour before being introduced to the nest, where the um, termites in the control group were introduced to a 1% tween 80 solution, which is what the fungus was suspended in to create the solution. Um, this was just done just to make sure that if there was any effect um, on, on the termites by the tween 80, we would see that pop up in the controls. So half of the nests were checked every four days, while the other half were left undisturbed for the full 20 day study. This was hopefully to eliminate any error or um, any, any circumstances that would affect the colony's survival um, being disturbed every day versus every couple of days. Um, finally, in phase at the end of phase three, moving into phase four, um, the termites were, when they were checked, deceased individuals were removed from the colony. They were surface sterilized with bleach, rinsed in sterilized water, and then plated on uh, potato dextrose agar for uh, us to confirm whether the cause of death was exposure to metarhizium fungus or something else. So this is just a fun little clip of the termites being exposed to the fungus. Um, you can see as they're walking around on it, they're grouped up together and a few of them are trembling. Um, that is an alarm behavior so that they're letting the others in the colony know like there's something going on here. And obviously that something going on was the fungus. So this study uh, is still ongoing. This is just the two data points that I have thus far. Um, after the fungal solution was made, um, it was established that the concentration is 
uh, they are on the bottom 5.9 uh, times 10 to the sixth power. Um, over on the left-hand side, you can see survival curves for the control nests and for the treatment. Um, above is the control, uh, where you can see that up to this point, day eight of the study, um, their termites are surviving, uh, with the exception of a couple that have been squished or um, died of bacterial infections. On the bottom there is the uh, fungal treatment group where the termites in the single chambered gallery and amorphous nests all died by day four. We still have some surviving in the multi-chambered nests now at day eight. So there is no evidence from these two dishes here on the bottom that the control nests have been uh, contaminated. In the upper right corner of the left hand petri dish, there's that little yellow spot. And then underneath that is a termite with, you can't see very well, but it's a little white spot around it. Those are both termites that have died from a bacterial infection. It's quite a strong smell when you open up that petri dish um, that, that is pretty characteristic of a, of a bacterial infection. The termite underneath that is one that died likely from a mold um, or another fungus. This one isn't growing um, in that characteristic way that we can identify that it is metarhizium. Over on the right hand side, there is the uh, termites from the fungal treatment group. And you can see there's this like puffy white, almost cloud-like uh, collection of fungus on top of the termites. So the fungal fatalities are positive for the metarhizium. And then here uh, we played around a little bit with an infrared camera. Infrared cameras are often used by pest control professionals to determine if there is a colony in someone's home in the walls. Um, on the left hand side, there is the uh, petri dish that the 20 termites were in. As you can see, there's, there's not much to identify that the termites are or are not present. Um, unfortunately, that's something that we found over here on the right side. Um, for the IR camera to be effective, it has to be a large group of termites. So that little yellow cluster you see with the green on the edges, that is a large group of termites moving around crawling on top of each other. So this study, like I said, is still ongoing. We're about halfway through now. Those survivorship curves are gonna look a little more interesting in a few more days. But so far we see that the multi-chambered nests appear to have the best survival. And the question that I asked myself being a scientist is why? Why did they survive best in the multi-chambered nests? Um, we're not sure yet. Like I said, the study is still ongoing, but we suspect that the uh, termites are able to spread out better in the multi-chambered nests they can detect when an individual is uh, sick from, I'm not sure if it's fungus or bacteria, but they can tell when they're sick and they may separate themselves out from the colony or they may be, um, they may be killed or cannibalized by other members of the colony just to separate them out from the healthy individuals. On the bottom here, you can see that's the multi-chambered nest. And on the right-hand side is an amorphous nest. And they're a little more clustered there on the bottom right with the amorphous nest. Uh, as far as future directions with this study, right now, I think a great direction to move in would be a behavioral study comparing the beha behaviors of uh, Reticulotermes phobibes and Reticulotermes virginicus because they are closely related, but there are uh, specific behaviors um, that are species specific that could uh, cause this study's results to be a little bit different from the previous study's results. Uh, secondly, a high versus a low fungal concentration. I wasn't expecting the termites in the amorphous single chambered and gallery nest to die so quickly. And that could be due to the uh, fungus being one that was uh, cultivated from soil rather than one that was uh, manufactured in a lab or cultivated in a lab. Um, it could be that it's uh, the metarhizium is, is a more or a differently evolved form than those that are cultured in the lab. Um, also, it could react differently to uh, the, the virginicus termites could react differently to the fungus than the flavipes termites. So that's another avenue to explore. Um, another repetition of this study with flavipes uh, to determine again uh, if there is a difference between the exposure to metarhizium in flavipes versus virginicus termites. And finally, finding a dye that will color the termites and the fungus. Like I said before, the Nile uh, blue dye was uh, anticipated to be used in this study, but uh, we had difficulty with a finding a 
dye that would dye the um, termites, but also penetrate the cell wall of the fungus without killing either the termites or the fungus. Uh, this is a list of the references that I use to uh, gather my information for the study. And finally, I would like to give a huge thank you to the people listed here. Uh, Dr. P, I could not have done this project without her support or guidance. I'd like to thank my roommate, Frankie, who spent countless hours punching holes in cardboard with me. I'd like to thank all of the faculty members of the biology department who have helped me in nurturing my love of science, Dr. Rock, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Townsend, Dr. GJ, Dr. Bartal, and Dr. Schaus. I'd also like to thank the Lighthouse for the support of my research through the undergraduate research grant. And lastly, I would like to thank you so much for watching.